Last time I told you how the difficult issue of indeterminism can be settled by a substitution of relative causality for absolute causality. But here I would like to see another kind of relation between events um, that is even more subtle than causality and uh, that is both very uh, important for Buddhism and very important for quantum physics. Um, it is called the dependent arising in Buddhism and entanglement in quantum physics. Um, what about dependent arising in Buddhism? There is a beautiful illustration of the idea of, uh, of um, dependent arising. It is the idea that two sheaves of reefs are leaning one against the other. So, in fact, when you put the two of them, they rely on one another. And, but if you remove one sheaf of reeds, then you remove it, but then the other one will fall. If you remove the other one, if you remove the other sheaf of reeds, then the other one will fall. So, the property leaning against of one sheaf of reeds co-arises with the property leaning against of the other sheaf of reeds. No uh, leaning against the other would exist if the other were not leaning towards the, uh, the first one. So there is a sort of balance of effects between the two elements here. Very dissimilar to the dissymmetric um, connection of causality, where cause starts before the effect, when, where cause produces the effect, and so on and so on. This alternative connection between events and, and um, entities is very typical of Buddhism, much more than causality itself. In Madhyamaka, the Middle Way Buddhism, uh, that was uh, partly created by the Indian philosopher of the second century, Nagarjuna. In Madhyamaka, uh, dependent arising is called, in Sanskrit language, pratityasamutpada. Okay, that means, um, that means uh, one going with the other, I would say. But this pratityasamutpada, is equivalent to another Sanskrit term, which is paratantra. Paratantra literally means woven of the other. One is woven of the other, the other is woven of the, of the one. So, that means that there is no intrinsic being, but there is only, I would say, interbeing. The temptation in Buddhism has been to reify this finding of interdependence or this finding of dependent arising. It has been to say, okay, that's fine. The, nature, the ultimate nature of the world is to be interdependent. The ultimate nature of the world is to be empty of own being. The ultimate nature of the world is to be a network. Okay? But... But um, the true Madhyamaka th thinkers don't say that. They use interdependence to remove false conception, but they don't turn interdependence into an alternative conception. Um, and um, for instance, Nagarjuna says that there is nothing that is non-empty. How could there be something empty? Okay. So, if, if everything is such that it is not, not empty, then it's absurd to say that there is something that is empty. Because saying that there is something that is empty is tantamount to say that something exists and has a sort of sticker property called emptiness. And this is absurd. This is against the very criticism of own being. 
And Dengarjuna finishes saying, those who are possessed of the view of emptiness as are said to be incorrigible. I mean, emptiness is the, re is the relinquishment of all views. It cannot be a view by itself. All views are relinquished, in, including the idea that the intrinsic nature of the world is to, is to, to have emptiness as its nature. It's, for Nakarjuna, it's a non, non sequitur. So we could say, according to the most advanced doctrine of Buddhism, interdependence itself is dependently arisen, and emptiness itself is empty. Okay? Emptiness is no view. Interdependence is not the nature, the ultimate intrinsic nature of the world. So, in quantum physics, things are a little bit similar, as you will see. There is a concept in quantum physics that is called entanglement. Entanglement means that in certain cases, when you have two elements, they don't have separate states, but they have a state for the whole. Namely, the two things have a state taken together, but one thing has no state of its own. You could say that they have only a relative state instead of two absolute states. For instance, let's suppose, let's take a couple of particles that you prepare in, um, in such a state that the value, the global value of their angular momentum, angular momentum or, or, or spin is, you know, the, I would say the, the quantity of rotation of a particle. So, you prepare them in such a way that the sum of their angular momentum terms are zero. In that case, you can say that if you measure the, the angular momentum or the spin of one uh, element, and you find that it has a positive value, then necessarily the momentum, the angular momentum you measure for the other element will be exactly opposite to the first one, so that the sum will be exactly equal to zero. So you know that. You know that if you measure um, something up on the first element, the measurement of the other element will give the result down. But you have absolutely no reason to say that even before measurement, this one had um, moment, angular moment or, um, or spin up and this one down. It could have been otherwise. The only condition that was stated in the initial uh, this quantum mechanical description was that the sum of the two had to be equal to zero. Nothing else and nothing more. Okay? So you can say that the property, uh, sp say, uh, spin of the one, has no existence of its own, but only relative to the other particle. You could say uh, that they are I would say, dependently horizon. Now, beware, there is something even more um, interesting here. Because let's suppose, as it is often the case, that you have no other criterion than the spin to distinguish the two particles. For instance, you could say they have the same mass, they have the same charge, they even have the same distribution of probability uh, in space, and therefore nothing distinguishes them, except for the fact that the spin of the one is opposite to the spin of the other. Nothing more. But since you don't know the spin of the one and the spin of the other, but only the fact that they are opposite to each other, that means that these two particles have no intrinsic existence, but only relative existence. 
They can say, be said to be two, not one, just because they have opposite values of their spin, not because they are different from the point of view of their having a different mass, a different charge, or a different position. Nothing of that is, is possible, only that they have an opposite value of their spin. That's it. So, we have relative properties and rel relative identity and therefore relative entities. No absolute entities, no absolute properties. Should we reify this idea again? Should we say that relations are real but not entities? Or relations are real and not properties? Something similar has been said by David Mermin in 1998. He said, correlations have physical reality, that which they correlate does not. That means that clearly, in this idea of quantum entanglement, it looks like the relation between two things exists, but not the things themselves. Okay. But in fact, there is a theorem that shows that even this reification of relations doesn't fit the bill. It doesn't work in quantum mechanics. So you have to relinquish even the reification of relations, just as you had to relinqu relinquish the reification of relations in uh, Buddhism, or the reification of emptiness or interdependence in Buddhism. Nothing like real or Nothing like absolute existence of relation can be accepted. Okay, you have seen uh, this interesting quantum property called entanglement. It means that no particle has a state of its own, but a, a state relative to another particle. Or no entity exists of its own. It exists relative to something else. But this strong connection between two entities this uh, strong entanglement, as it is called, could be thought of as, um, you know, the generator of a non-local influence between the two particles. And people often speak of non-locality when uh, quantum mechanics is at stake. So, is it true that you can have non-local effect with this so-called entanglement of two quantum particles? I think that it's not the case. But in order to show this, I will start with the problem as it was raised by Einstein. Einstein said, okay, suppose that only the distance between particles A and B is defined. This is a typical entangled state. Okay, only the distance between the two is, is defined, but they can be here or here or here or here, okay? But when you know the precise position of this one, then by the fact that you know the distance between the two, now you know immediately the position of the other. Is it the case that the position of the other has been suddenly determined by the knowledge of the position of the first one? By no means. In fact, what quantum mechanics tells you is that knowing the position of this one, you can predict that if you go towards this one, this other one, and you measure its position, then you will find this and that position. It's only a prediction. It's not an immediate determination. The relation between the two particles is just as relative to the possibility to evaluate it at the end of the process as the position of the individual particles is. Everything is relative, not only the position of the particles, but also the relative position of the two particles. Even relations are relative, to, to continue the slogan, I would say. So, this process doesn't allow uh, an, uh, an instantaneous communication between the two particles. It doesn't allow a so-called non-local effect. And there is indeed a theorem that says in quantum physics that um, 
and instantaneous signals cannot be obtained out of the entanglement between two particles. So entanglement doesn't entail non-locality. Uh, there are, and uh, for instance, uh, Christopher Fuchs often says that um, the non-locality is not a property of quantum mechanics, it's a property of certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. Which interpretations? The, inter the interpretations that are, can be, the interpretations that can be called absolutistic. But for a relativistic uh, interpretation of quantum physics, there is no point speaking of non-locality. So, I will conclude this, um, uh, this series with an attempt to compare Buddhism and physics from the standpoint of the reasons why they are sim so similar. Why are quantum physics and, and uh, certain critical concepts of Buddhism so similar? Why is it so? I would say not why the Buddhist view and the quantum view of the world are similar. I discarded this immediately, you remember. But why do these two radical deconstructions, criticisms of metaphysical views of the world, turn out to be so similar? Why is it so? Just for one reason. Because in both cases, the field to be studied cannot be separated from the subject who studies. If you study consciousness by contemplation, if you self-study your own field of experience, of course you cannot be detached from what you study, because what you study is yourself. But in quantum physics it's a little bit different. In quantum physics, you cannot detach yourself from the field that you study, not because you are identical with what you study, but because you, in order to study it, you have to interact it in such a strong way that you cannot disentangle yourself from what you study. So in both cases, the reason why you cannot elaborate a view of the world out of the phenomena you study is that you are so caught in what you want to study, so intermingled with what you, you want to study, that the type of, of description you arrive at is strangely similar.